It's Sunday, May 30th, and here's your Sunday School lesson for today. We're going to be looking at the book of Exodus. And this book has 40 chapters, 1,213 verses, 32,692 words. The author is Moses, the same guy that wrote Genesis. And Exodus means to exit. The time is 1706 B.C. to 1490 B.C. Remember, each book of the Bible has three applications. Historical, devotional, and doctrinal. Historically, Exodus is about the redemption of Israel through the Passover lamb, and it shows their new life that's no longer in bondage to Egypt. Now, devotionally, what we can get out of it it pictures our redemption through the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. It pictures our life as a lost person in bondage to the world and our life after salvation. Now, doctrinally, Moses and Aaron picture the two witnesses that's coming in the trib, and Pharaoh pictures the Antichrist that's coming in the trib. Now, with that being said, I want to talk about your Exodus journey Let's look at the book of Exodus and think about your Exodus journey, your life as a lost person, now a saved person. First thing is, when you were lost, you were a slave to sin. You were a slave to sin. Just like Israel was a slave in Egypt. Now, how did Israel end up in Egypt? Well, Jacob, you know Jacob back in Genesis, had sons and they were the 12 became the 12 tribes one of the sons joseph was sold into egypt he becomes the second ruler in the kingdom under pharaoh jacob and his sons come to egypt because of a famine and end up staying there and you know the story with joseph and his brothers and joseph pictures a is a picture of jesus christ and his brothers or picture the unbelieving Jews who end up believing Joseph is their brother. And the, uh, he, Joseph ends up giving them food because of the famine. But then all that generation dies off and there arose a king which knew not Joseph in the book of Exodus. All that generation died off. And in Exodus 1 through 3, it pictures a lost pictures lost people under the bondage to the world. Egypt pictures the world and Pharaoh pictures the devil keeping them in bondage. And it says in Exodus 1, 11 through 14 that these people are afflicted. It says, but the more they afflicted him, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage. So you're not free when you're living for sin. You are in bondage to it. It makes you serve with rigor. It afflicts you. It keeps you in hard, hard bondage. Proverbs thirteen fifteen says, Good understanding giveth favor. But the way of transgressors is hard. Just see the life of anyone who has dedicated their life to sin. Fornication leads to disease. Drugs leads to addiction. Gambling leads to being broken in debt. And when you get saved, you have the power of God in you to make it possible to have victory over those things. But before salvation, you are in bondage to it. To the flesh, the world, and the devil. So the first thing, you're a slave to sin. But during this time, the Savior is calling. In Exodus 4 through 6, God raises someone to deliver Israel. He raises up Moses. And Moses pictures Jesus Christ. In Acts 7.37, it says, This is that Moses, which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. Israel rejects Moses just like they did Jesus. Jesus Christ is that prophet like unto Moses. 
In Exodus 5, 21, it says, And they said unto them, The Lord look upon you and judge, because ye have made our savor to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants to put a sword in their hand to slay us. Just like Moses is attempting to deliver Israel, Jesus wants to deliver sinners. Just like Moses was rejected, many times you rejected the Savior. This is because when the Savior calls, the next thing is Satan resists. In Acts 7 through 11, you find Pharaoh has his heart hardened and will not let the people go. This picture is Satan trying his best to keep you from accepting Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The devil is going to try all that he can to keep you from accepting Jesus Christ. He'll say, well, you're going to have to give up this, or what will your wife think, or what will your religion think, or you're going to have to quit listening to your favorite band that's got you through so much depression over the years, and you can't live without that band that you listen to. All these things like that, he's going to say, you know, you can go... You can be religious. You don't have to get saved. You, you can go to church. You don't have to get saved. They'll say things like that. Any way to keep you from actually believing the gospel. So the Savior calls, but Satan resists. And if you don't get saved, you just stay a slave to sin. But if you realize that nothing is more important than your eternal soul... You'll find salvation through the blood. In Exodus 12, you have the famous chapter about the Passover. And the lamb pictures Jesus Christ. Israel had to apply the blood of the lamb to the two side posts and the lintel. And this pictures Jesus being crucified between two thieves. You were a slave to sin. You were in bondage to the world. Jesus wanted to deliver you. Then one day you received him. And at this time you got the blood applied to your soul. In John 1, 29, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. For you, the Lamb is Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, they had all those bloody animal sacrifices, but the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that will take away your sin permanently. He only had to offer himself once. And the moment you believe, you don't have to keep offering animal sacrifices like they did in the Old Testament, you're saved once and for all. You have salvation through the blood. You're no longer a slave to sin if you're choosing to walk in the Spirit. Now, you can continue to be a slave to sin after you're saved if you choose to walk in the flesh and not walk in the Spirit. But now that you've got salvation through the blood and you've got Christ in you, the hope of glory, you can have victory over sin. Never completely, but it doesn't have to be like it was in Egypt when you were in bondage to it. Now we're going to talk about sanctification. Setting yourself apart. You see, at salvation, you were sanctified in the sense of your salvation once and for all. But then there is another type of sanctification where you set apart yourself from the world every day that you wake up. Every day when your alarm goes off, you have to make a conscious decision to be what God wants you to be. In Exodus 13, God says to Moses, in Exodus 13, 1 and 2, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn. After salvation, you need to sanctify yourself. You need to set apart from the world to serve Jesus Christ. The key thing is notice. The key thing to notice is that this is after salvation, not before. You can't sanctify yourself before you're saved. Before you're saved, you're dead in trespasses and sins. In Exodus 14, Moses and Israel cross the Red Sea on dry ground, and 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 2 calls this a baptism. Picturing how baptism is a part of your sanctification, 
not your salvation. You know, you have a lot of people that think baptism is a part of your salvation. They think you must be water baptized to be saved, but we know that it's the spirit baptism that saves. And, you know, this story in Exodus can also picture the spirit baptism that happens out of salvation because Moses and Israel didn't even touch the water. And the water washed away Pharaoh's army that was keeping them in bondage. So it's called a baptism, yet they the water never touched them. This shows that there's different baptisms in the scriptures, and the spirit baptism is the baptism which saves. It has nothing to do with water. When you believe the gospel, you didn't even know it, but you were baptized into the body of Christ. It's the spirit baptism. You may not have even known that up until this point. But that's the only baptism that saves is when you were baptized into the body of Christ. And the Lord does that. It's not a work, but you didn't even know about it. It's not something you do. But after salvation, you need to strive to live as holy as you can, even though you'll never be perfect. And that's sanctification. Set yourself apart. A lot of people get salvation mixed up with sanctification. They say, well, you have to, if a person doesn't have a changed life, if they're not living a godly lifestyle after they're saved, then they really didn't get saved. That's confusing salvation with sanctification. And that's ignoring all the places where Paul says to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. So obviously a Christian can walk in the flesh. But now, the next thing is you have a song of victory. In Exodus 15, you have where it talks about the song of Moses. And it's a song exalting the Lord. After salvation, you need to let God put a new song in your heart. Psalm 40 and verse 3, And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. Before I was saved, I did not have a song of victory. My music of choice was something like Bullet from Our Valentine, Fall Out Boy, um, Disturbed. You know, all these bands that it's depressing, it just gets you down, it's darkness, the heavy metal stuff and all the music I listened to it was not songs of victory it was songs of someone who was defeated but now at salvation you get a song of victory you don't have to listen to Incubus anymore is that band even still around you don't have to listen to um, Deadpool or Deftones or any of these bands that kind of just get you down you can have a new song in your heart now the scriptures revealed before salvation you had no idea what the bible was talking about but now the scriptures are revealed and in exodus chapter 16 the lord drops down manna from heaven and this pictures the word of god that came from heaven something you need to do after you get saved is read study memorize and meditate on the word. The manna also pictures the living word. Because in John 6, 31 through 33, it says, Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. So back in Exodus, the Lord dropped food from the sky. It was cloudy with a chance of meatballs and the, the food was coming out of the sky. But Jesus is the true manna from heaven. He is the one that giveth life. And it says in Matthew 4, 4, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You know how well, the first thing you do when you wake up for a lot of people is eat breakfast. Why not trade in your breakfast, if you can, for just the scriptures? 
and then at lunch just trade in lunch for the scriptures in my lunch box right now there's no food in it i have a bible in it that's in a bible cover i just have the lunch box to give it extra protection because it's my main bible and i work in a freezer so i'm just giving it extra protection with the lunch box but i'm trading in the food for the words now if you've got medical problems or something i wouldn't suggest that but if you want to get the word running through you why not just trade in the food most of your food for the words you'll lose weight that way you'll save money that way and you'll learn a lot more bible that way because i mean you spend i mean i'm a fast eater but eating breakfast i might spend 10 minutes eating lunch i might spend 10 minutes but a lot of people 30 minutes for both there's an hour that you could be in the scriptures and i mean on each break you know i can get a, if i got a good partner i can get a lot of breaks in and read tons of bible or make tons of studies trade in your spare time for bible time make make bible time in your spare time because the scriptures are revealed now and you need the scriptures because the next thing, spiritual warfare. In Exodus chapter 17, you see the battle against Amalek. And when Moses has his hands raised, Joshua and Israel win the fight. But when he, his hands drop, they start losing the fight. This pictures spiritual warfare. Moses pictures you fighting the battle through prayer. In 1 Timothy 2.8, it says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So Joshua pictures Jesus having victory in our lives when we keep a good prayer life because when Moses has his hands raised, Joshua is winning. When he has his hands down, Joshua is not winning. When you have your hands up in prayer, Jesus is really doing the work in your life. When you stop praying, it may not be that way. Amalek pictures the flesh and spiritual wickedness that we battle every day. And when Moses has his hands raised, they're defeating Amalek. And then you have Aaron and Hur holding up Moses' hands when he gets tired. And this pictures the brethren holding you up in prayer when you feel like you can't do it anymore. See, the Bible is an amazing book. Every story is significant. Every story has something for us. Every story hap actually happened in history, so it's a reality. It's not just a fake story. It really happened. That story, There was a time, if you could get in a time machine and in a DeLorean with a flux capacitor and go back to Exodus, you could look at Moses holding his hands up in the air and Aaron and her holding his hands up and Joshua winning the fight. And then today, in 2021 you can get spiritual application out of this and say, well, I need to pray and then Jesus will fight my battles for me. But that is spiritual warfare going on. And next, you have the spirit in your tabernacle. In chapters 25 through 27, God gives Moses instructions on the tabernacle. This tabernacle pictures where God dwells today, that is, in us. Because in 1 Corinthians six nineteen through 20, it says, What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Then in 1 Thessalonians 4.4, 4, it says that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. 2 Peter 1.14 says, Knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ had showed me. He's talking about his body there. In Exodus, the tabernacle is a place where God would dwell temporarily. Today, our vile bodies is a place where he dwells temporarily. And then at the rapture, we get a new body. You see, in the Old Testament, God had a temple for his people, but today he has his people for a temple. 
And you need to possess your vessel and sanctification and honor because it's the temple. You have the Spirit of God in you. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. You're sealed unto the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit. That should make you want to live right because wherever you go, God goes. Not only is he there already because he's omnipresent, but in a sense you're taking him there because he lives in you as well. If you go to the club, he goes to the club. If you go to the bars, he goes to the bars. If you go to a strip club, he goes to the strip club. If you go to a place where you're participating in a bunch of sinful activities, you're taking him there too. The Spirit is in you. The next thing is sacrifice as a priest. In chapters 28 through 31, it talks a lot about the priesthood. The priests were from the tribe of Levi and specifically were Aaron and his sons. Today, as a born-again believer, we are all priests and not in the sense of the Catholic Church. We don't have a confessional booth. We're not commanded not to marry like the Catholic Church commands their priests not to marry, which is actually a doctrine of a devil, according to Paul. Forbidding someone to marry is a sin. In 1 Peter 2, 5, it says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. We have access to go straight in to talk to God. We don't need a priest like the Catholic Church. We offer spiritual sacrifices. If you're saved, you are a priest. This is the priesthood of the believer. And while you don't do exactly what Aaron and those guys did, that was a picture of what was to come. And now the last thing, we're servants to God in the ministry. In chapters 32 through 40, you see Moses fasting 40 days and 40 nights. You have Moses' face shining when he comes down off the mountain. This pictures how spending time with Jesus Christ will change your countenance and you can be a light to people. You see Moses having to rebuke the people for a golden calf in Exodus chapter 32. And you see God gives Moses two new tables of stone. Sometimes you have to go back and do the same things over and over again. Because you're being a servant to God in the ministry. Moses was doing, he was never just taking a break. You see him, he's fasting, he's going up in the mountain, he goes up and down that mountain over and over again. He has to rebuke the people, he has to pray so that the people don't die. Sometimes he's praying for them to die. You know, he's constantly bombarded by the people wanting to. You know, get his authority taken away. When you get saved, you need to become a servant to God. When you get saved, you sacrifice as a priest. When you get saved, you realize the spirit is in your tabernacle. You realize that there's spiritual warfare. You realize that these scriptures are revealed and you need to open them every day and read them. Realize that you need to put the song of victory in your heart, not what's on the top 100 right now. You need to realize that you need to have sanctification. You need to set yourself apart from this world every day when you get up. You need to realize that you need to be thankful for the salvation through the blood and that even though you're saved, Satan is still going to try to resist you. And you, rem you need to remember the Savior. You need to remember that you don't no longer have to, you no longer have to be a slave to sin. But Exodus, it shows you your Exodus journey for every saved person. You were a slave to sin in the world. The Savior called. You were saved through the blood. But this has been your Exodus journey.